Women had to walk a long path in Brazil to conquer the most basic right of just practicing the sport. One could argue that they could have benefited from Brazil's long football tradition overall. But in reality, the struggle to achieve even basic conditions for practice, already hard considering legal and systemic delays, was made even harder due to structural gender inequality and sexism. It was only recently that the women's national team has been allowed to use the Brazilian Federation's training center. For years, they could only use it when the men's team was not there. And it was just in 2020 that the Brazilian Football Confederation, or CBF, established equal treatment, payment, and prizes for both the men and the women's squad in the Olympic Games, but not for the World Cup. These achievements came late after a long history of poor conditions and a struggle for recognition. If the conditions for the national team were not ideal, in Brazilian clubs, the situation for women was even worse, meaning that many professional players could not dedicate themselves exclusively to the sport. And to get some insight on that, we spoke with Evie Casagrande, former footballer and current head of performance of the Brazilian women's national team. Would you say that the players today, both in Brazil and mainly in Brazil, but if you have comments on the US too, that'd be great. Um, would you say they have more structure and recognition compared to when you started out? Definitely. My first experience in football, like 11 v 11 football, I think there we barely would go to the gym. Um, I think I've been through the gym. I had to go to the gym outside of the club to because there's no stru- like structure or resources available. Um, we didn't have somebody to actually um, we structure and manage the load, you know, and the, the training sessions. So then as soon as I get to the club, it's already three o'clock. We train until six. I get home at around 9, 30, 10 p.m. At that point, I'm completely exhausted. There's no way that I could actually focus on the study part of it. And at the time, I wanted to be a doctor. So it was impossible for me to do that um, or even do both. So... That's when I found out about uh, America and that I could potentially do both and have a, a degree and actually be able to do um, uh, to play in a competitive environment at the same time as having the degree, which I thought I I always think it's very important because football is not forever and you never know you know it's so unpredictable um, with injuries and stuff like that. So for me, it was very good that. I had that degree, and that's why I'm here. I think it made it it made it easier um, that that kind of uh, transition. So yeah, that was that was the reason that I left Brazil was it was um, because of that. And I think today we have we have like a holistic uh, view of performance where we have doctors, we have physios, we have psychologists. Back then, I mean, I had problems with my confidence as a player and. You just had to deal with it because you, you, you might not have the, the resources to, to deal with it back in the day. So I think today we have more and more staff to, to be able to see the whole picture of the athlete and make sure we literally have everything that the athlete needs, nutrition, uh, psychology, and even female health now. It, you know, I, as a player, had no idea the impact of the menstrual cycle in the performance or even on things like what to eat and what not to eat things that now because i study and it it's it's better now because we have staff that can educate and empower those uh those girls but back then it was very hard to to not only have those people around us um but also have that management of load where You know, we're not playing 11 v 11 every day because otherwise you're going to kill your players or, you know, or you're just running laps um, instead of actually playing football and and making sure you're fit using football. So definitely a lot, a lot have changed. Um, I think it's, there's still a long way to go, um, but I think we're definitely on the right path. I think um, there is more... You know, especially in in the big clubs, there's uh, big medical departments, there's more staff, there's more um, 
more resources. I think it's an education. I think that's the biggest part is uh, having people that are able to they have the degree to educate the players so the players can can do the work for themselves too. Because I think we can't cannot just rely on the on the professionals to to guide you. I think it's our job as professional professionals in the field to to really make sure we empower the players and I think that's something that we didn't I didn't have as a player and I wish I had that's one of the reasons I wanted to be a, a high performance coach because I wanted to make sure I would empower my players the way that I was not empowered um, I didn't know anything about nutrition and you know I didn't know about how to take care of my body I didn't know how to to have you know just a kind of conscious of my own body it, that and it's so important just like self regulation self understanding of what you need as a player um and i think now they have that that like especially in the big clubs they have that in their on their side and i think it's up to them to use that in their favor uh and extract the best out of them but of course there's There's still a long way to go. The practice of football by women was banned in Brazil in 1941. Some matches were organized until the early 1940s, but instead of attracting fans, they sparked outrage, mostly from men. Following the buzz, then-president Getulio Vargas issued a decree that was supposed to protect women from the violence of the sport, which could harm their motherly nature. The decree was not revoked until 1979, and it was only in 1983 that women's football became legal again. Meanwhile, in the United States, a 1972 bill called Title IX made gender equality mandatory in education, including collegiate athletics. By no coincidence, football, or soccer, became hugely popular among women in the United States. And 51 years later, the U.S. national team is the most successful women's football national squad with four World Cup titles and four Olympic gold medals. And I'm wondering, too, building off of that a little bit, what you see as the difference in the this is just diving into that a little deeper. But what you see in the difference in the physical and technical preparation of athletes today and when you started training. Mm -hmm. So in terms of you didn't have role models, but also if we're looking at what that looked like on the ground. Mm -hmm. I think the, there's still I think there's still a lot to be done in that aspect. I think there's um, a lot of environments there is very isolated, like the physical side and the the technical side it's getting better but I think as performance coaches I think we have to walk hand in hand with the technical staff because we need to know what they're going to do in training what's the the plan um, so then we can really be way more effective I think gone were the days where we were just asking players to just run laps and just you know do their fitness uh, training just by running I think Nowadays, we can really be more effective by using the ball. And to be able to do that, it has to be a, a connection between you and the technical staff. Um, because if I know what they're going to do in training, I can really go to them and say, okay, in this drill, can we push the intensity by increasing the number of sets and reps, making sure they have the, the appropriate rest so then they're going high intensity every every rep. And they're just not going fatigue, fatigue, fatigue. And then they're just going, slowing down and not actually getting the technical side. So I think I think one doesn't exist without the other. Um, and I think as, as when there is a, a very high relationship and very um, big relationship between the two, that's when the things flow a little bit better. That's where our physical side is, is improved more and their technical side is improved more because that's what you want. You want them to be able to play. Um, and at, at the end of the day is how you play the game. Um, so what I do is to facilitate that for, for them. So um, it's when we think that the fitness side of things should be the, the priority, that's when things go wrong. And I think it's the other way around. I think we help them to, to perform at their highest level um, in, in the game. 
Marta's generation grew up in a time when they could play football, but still faced many challenges to make a career out of it. When they made it to the national team, bringing visibility and support to Brazilian women's football was also a goal. Since the 2000s, they've led the Brazilian national team to success in various women's competitions. It started with winning the 2003 Pan American Games, which presented Marta to the world, then a second place in the 2007 World Cup, and the silver medals won in the 2004 and 2008 Olympic Games. It is not a coincidence that after all the efforts that Marta's generation put into developing the sport, the conditions are slowly getting better. And I'm curious too how you see the difference between investment in men's and women's football in the national teams and in the clubs too. I think from a national team perspective, I think we, we, we're really lucky. I think we have, like for this World Cup, we have all the resources that we need. I mean, this preparation we have. We're, I was talking with our administration and logistic department because they, they did an amazing job in putting us in the best place in the Gold Coast with the best facility. Um, we had everything that we needed. We had all the equipment that we needed. Um, so that that makes a, a huge difference for us in our preparation. And I think um, in, in the club at the club level, I think there's still a long way to go. There's some clubs that do... Um, offer that investment um, and some clubs that are still on the the way to do that Um, but I think when we the more that we have leaders and the the right positions to push that um, the women's game for the right reasons I think that's when the game is going to continue to evolve and evolve um, very well and like I said I think the with the World Cup now and how the media is helping us with, you know, uh, making sure they they show our trajectory. They show the that the players there they have a history, they have a story behind what they do. They're just not a uh, a face in the, on the TV. They actually have fought a lot to be where they are. Um, and you know, when you see players like Marta, that that Formiga, all those big players that helped shape that for for the generation now. And it's it's very cool to see that the younger generation, they are very appreciative of that and they are pushing it. Um, they're doing their part and working very hard and being very disciplined and very determined. And that's, I think the more that that happens, the more the, um, the investment is gonna come. So so the idea is to, to keep pushing. Um, but yeah, we're very lucky here to to have everything we needed and the, and the preparation that we needed. And it makes our jobs so much easier. In the 70s, Brazil was already the land of football we know today. Pelé was already considered the best player in history. Brazil had already won three World Cups and the national team's yellow shirt was already widely celebrated as a synonym of the beautiful game. Throughout the 20th century, football became a reason of pride for all Brazilians. And with the sport's professionalization in the beginning of the 1930s, football also became a path out of poverty for many young people, but not for girls. 44 years passed between the creation of Brazilian men's national team and its first World Cup championship. And another 28 years went by between the country's first title in the sport and the women's national team's first match in 1986, the same year Marta was born. And I'm wondering, too, we're trying to explain to people outside of Brazil why the Brazilian women's team has not won a World Cup yet, apart from the men's team having several titles. And I'm wondering how you would explain that to them? I think the investment um, is a big part. I think um, being able for youth players to be able to um, have the opportunity to showcase their their talent and have the conditions and the, the clubs at the youth level to be um, to have the training that they need to develop as football players. And I think that's where all the 
um, when we talk about injuries and they all say, oh, the injuries is because females are more prone to injuries. I think we need to shift that mindset. And I think that's where, you know, the, we need to make sure we develop young female players the right way. We need to make sure that we teach them the right movement. We need to have the, the right resources, the right coaches, the right people um, to help them succeed. And I think, like I said, I think the more investment is going gonna, is gonna to help that. And I think the more uh, personnel and staff that they put in clubs um, to grow the game in the beginning, like under nine, under 10, under 11, um, get that, you know, we, we talk about places like America where they, they start young and they, they have those academies. And I think Brazil is growing a lot on that. And I think people are not seeing it yet, but there's a lot of good work being done in the country for a lot, a lot of good professionals, a lot of good coaches there in clubs. They are passionate about the game. But like I said, it's it's it, we have to trust the process. I think it, people sometimes, they think it's going to come very quickly. And when you think about culturally, uh, places like America, they've done for so long. And that's what that's, you know, that that they help them. Um, but I don't think I think we can't forget that we are um, doing a lot in that. And there's a lot of things being done, but people need to trust the process. And I think it, it, it's a it's a, a marathon, not a sprint, as they say. So I think in the next few years, we're gonna we're seeing it already, but we're gonna see it more and more. Um, how we're gonna have more talent? That they're gonna have more players that are gonna be ready for the game, and they're gonna be prepared to play at the highest level. For sure. And I'm wondering, expanding on that point about the difference between Brazil and U.S. with women's soccer, because you worked in the U.S. for some time, and I'm curious what difference you see in women's soccer between the U.S. and Brazil, if you could expand on that a little mm -hmm. bit more. Yeah, I think the, the big advantage of America is that they have that um, that investment in the university level um, game. So we have players that have been through the education and through the, the college journey, and they have had coaching in strength conditioning. So f physically, they are able to really um, be... It's, it's more of an advantage, advantage for them just because they've been through that system. And I think the high school system in America is completely different than in Brazil, right? So I think in Brazil, I played futsal for 10 years. Um, the schools, they don't have the high school like system where you have huge 11 v 11 football pitches for players to, to play. Um, so I just found out football as 11 v 11 football when I was 16. And that was actually my first tryout for the under-17 national team. And um, it was almost like, I'm just going to try this out. I never actually, I, I actually bought the soccer cleats on my way to the tryout um, because I, I just played futsal. And my uncle said, you know, there's this trial, there's this trial and you should just try out, you know. And I ended up going to the end and, and then I realized that I, my place was in a football field, 11 v 11. Um, and and um, so that for me was a switch, but it was not only until I was 16, can you imagine that? Until I was 16, 15, I was actually with my um, playing on a football pitch for the first time. So then imagine how many girls been through the same path where, you know, you have, you don't have that kind of system where it allows you to, to do that but now like i said it's getting better when better and better but the us i think culturally have a ha, have a strong foundation on high school in high schools and college when when players get out of college go to the nwsl physically they are way above because no fault fault on the brazilians but it's 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 how they they grew up and the resources that they had um so i think and that's why i'm Posing that question, question is because when we do have the investment, can you imagine how good it's going to be, and and how you know now that the 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 clubs and the players can go to under fifteen, can go to under ten in clubs and actually co be coached um, 
quality of movement and fitness and, and all those things. I think the future is quite bright um, for Brazil. And I think uh, it's as already have started, um, but it's, I think it's just going to go up from now and hopefully more investment is going to come in the big clubs. So we continue that, um, that trend. Marta, crowned six times the world's best football player by FIFA, is about to play her last Women's World Cup, which means it's the 37-year-old athlete's last shot at helping Brazil get its first title. How are you feeling about Marta's last season, and what are you expecting from this last participation on the World Cup? Marta is, um, I have a huge admiration from, for her because I've, I've coached her in Orlando Pride um, in 2018, 19, I think. And um, I mean, I grew up watching her play and she was, you know, Marta. And I think her, her passion for the game and her dedication, and her, the energy that she brings, no matter what, I think is... Con- extremely contagious and it's it's very exciting that we get to see that um for this world cup and i think no matter what happens i think she's she's gonna bring her her energy and her passion and her skills and whatever she brings it's 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 very special so i think the world needs to see that uh one more time and it's very cool to, for us to, to be able to see it firsthand here. For me, firsthand in the national team. Um, and um, I think that, yeah, it's very exciting for her and for everyone that, that get to experience that. Whether Brazil wins the World Cup or not, Marta's achievements are solid, both on and off the pitch. I think, like I said, I think there's still a lot to, to be done, especially in specific um, places in the world, but I think we are we are on the right path, um, especially with women's fo- football. And I think the World Cup will help showcase that and help grow the game even more. I think this World Cup is gonna be a big is gonna play a big part on that. So there's more recognition. There's not more media. Uh, if you can see it, you can be it. I always say that. So not only for the players, but also for people that want to do the jobs that we do. Uh, females that want to do the jobs that we do and they don't see as many women uh, coaches out there. And if they see it in, on TV, they're like, okay, I can be that person. So I think it's all about empowerment and, and educating. Pelé's father was already a football player who gave the king lessons from early on. Afterwards, Pelé became a role model for millions of Brazilians. Marta didn't have someone to look up to like that, but that's now one less problem for future generations. Thank you.